paltry and small, a shepherd's village. The prophets anticipated it a location for a mighty king's birth. But prophecies had been twisted and tangled. The memory of this town faded, like the ink on the parchment of scripture. Unsuspecting Bethlehem was not ready for the unexpected arrival. In this little shepherd village, a baby was born. A baby whose first breath would dawn a new age, and whose last breath, new life. A baby whose life will shape history, and whose death will shape eternity. Bethlehem, the king is born. Days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and of the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there were no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you that you will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and to see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry, and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which they had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told to them. As we look at that great Christmas story, we, as we read, it's a fresh and anew to me every time that I read it. And today... I want you to think about this with me as we think about, for just a moment, the emotion of the shepherds. Because they're going to journey now just a little ways. Probably a mile or so is all they had to go, probably from where they were outside of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is about six miles southeast of Jerusalem. Okay, so it's a little town that sits there and, and primarily in the early days was a shepherding town. Okay, that's what they did all around that town. They, they had fields, many fields where they grew flock. And so a lot went on there. So the shepherds are out in the fields. They're keeping watch over their flock by night as we, we hear. And then when the angels appear to them, all of a sudden they begin to bring to them this news. And this news begins to bring emotion. When they begin to hear the news of what is transpiring in their moment, where they are, their emotions is greatly affected. And the first thing we see about their emotion is uh, when it says there, when the angel had spoken to them and they were terribly uh, frightened and uh, terribly afraid. All of a sudden in this moment, if you can imagine, you have uh, an angelic visit right before you standing above you, and he's proclaiming to you a message of God. It's unsuspecting. And all of a sudden in that moment, it says there they were, and the word is, terribly frightened. They weren't just a little frightened. They were terribly frightened. So all of a sudden, they're overcome in this moment with an emotion of fear. 
And you think about that fear. That it's, you think about a holy God coming into contact and his angels coming in contact with a human being. There's going to be some emotion in that. There's going to be something that could cause you to feel afraid in that moment. Man, I had not, not planned on saying this, but I feel like I need to say this. This happened once uh, a long time ago, many years ago, in a situation that I was in. And, and, and I was in my house, okay, and I was... Zach had been sick, and I'd been in and out of his bedroom several times. Okay, so I go into the bathroom right across the hall from him. And when I go in there, when I come around the corner, all of a sudden, at his door, there was something standing there. Okay, and I run right into it and through it. And I had shivers all over me, and I was shaking, and I ran down the hall in our house, dove over the foot of the bed... And I'm laying in the bed, and I'm shaking, and I'm shaking. And Karen goes, what in the world is wrong with you? And I said, I don't know. There's something standing at Zach's door. And, and it, it looked like an angel, and I don't even believe that stuff. And I was like t- terribly frightened. And God let me see for one millisecond a, sl- a glimmer of something and why that angel was standing at that door. And I just, I can't imagine knowing what that was, and in thinking of where these shepherds were in this moment, to see what they saw, to hear what they heard, and all of a sudden they're overcome with fear. I mean, you see that fear. You know what? Even, even sometimes at Christmas, the season causes some people to fear. There's fear. There's fear involved because we may not have what we think we need. We may not be able to do some things for somebody that, that we think we would do. There's lots of things in this season that will cause us to fear. But I want to tell you something. How awesome would it be to know a moment of knowing God and knowing Him so that He is so holy, that He is so amazing to us, that even in a moment of this presence, there's like, that, wow, the awe of the presence of God. They were able to know that in a moment. But the angel stood before them, and the angel said to them in verse 10, Don't be afraid. You do not have to be afraid, because I've got good news. Here's what I like. Of great joy. Great joy. He's going to give them some emotion beyond being afraid. He's going to talk to them about having joy. Great joy. He said, I've got some news that's going to be a great joy to you and a great joy to all people because in this moment there is born a a Savior. There's a Savior. But you know what? In their day, them being who they were, being where they were, they were always looking for the Messiah. They, They were always looking and hoping and praying for The anointed one. That's what the Messiah is. The Christ means the anointed one. And they were believing that that was going to be. And when they hear of that and the prospects of it being close to them, all of a sudden it says there's going to be some great joy. I want to tell you something for Christmas. We need to have and know some great joy. And we just need to know this joy because here's where joy is. Joy is something that happens on the inside of me that comes not from just something that's going on on the outside of me, but something that swells up on the inside of me that comes because of the presence of the Holy Spirit within me. It's the joy that wells up and comes forth and brings about something that is amazing for us. (laughs) I hear that acronym. I saw it years ago. Joy is this. It's Jesus, then others, then you. And when you can get life put together in that order where Jesus is the top, others come next, and you come last, you're moving in a position to know some of this place of godly joy. Because all of a sudden for them, you know what they're going to become like? All of a sudden just like, we're going. We're going there. They didn't have to. I love the way they talk about that. It is it spoke of them how they are. And here's what's happening. Joy is expressed in rejoicing. In rejoicing. If you have godly joy, you will rejoice. That is letting the joy flow out of you. Letting the godly joy flow out of you. So we see that in this story here. These these shepherds in verse 10 are told about a great joy which is going to be for all people. After they're told this story, it says, as the angels go away in verse 16, so they came in a hurry... uh, And I like the way the King James Bible says it. They came with haste. They came in a hurry. And they 
began to discuss what to do very quickly there. And it was seen that they're going to go and they're going to see Mary. They're going to see Joseph. They're going to see this baby. So he, he, here's, here's what my idea at that moment is. In their Christmas emotion, there was urgency. There was, see, within me, there's an emotion. There's a place where there's urgency. See, for us today, we need to understand life with some urgency because they had some urgency. All of a sudden, you know, the world uh, was all around them. Everything that's going on in their world was around them, just like it is for us. But all of a sudden, they get some information. They get some news. And in that news, there is suddenly some urgency. You know, Christmas brings some urgency to me in different ways. One of them is, I'm like the world's worst shopper. I'm the world's worst present buyer. I, and I just I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. It's just a part of that that, you know, we do. But it, I always feel that sense as it gets closer and closer. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do You got you to go. You compelled on the inside to go. Here's what I'm thinking. How awesome is it going to be to be compelled on the inside to be able to make a sense of expression of joy to God with a sense of urgency because I understand that time is of the essence. See, time was of the essence for the shepherds. So they realized they had to go with haste. They had to move. So all of a sudden, and then here's the other piece of this that's interesting to me in verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at the things they said. So here's the thing. The emotion, the, the feeling of, of wonder. Those shepherds. And here's the cool thing. Those shepherds were able to communicate and demonstrate some wonder. Because they had experienced some wonder. Because they had be able to see the one who was named Wonderful. When they encountered Wonderful, they knew wonder. And what they said had urgency and, and, uh, and, and some haste about it. So that when people heard it, they were doing this. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. How wonderful would it be if today in 2021, as we head into 2022, there was some wonder yeah. in the church. Amen. There was some wonder in the life of some children of God because all of a sudden they encountered God in a greater way than they've ever encountered Him before. All of a sudden they realize things they've never realized before. They see something they've never seen before. They experience the presence of God they've never experienced before. And they go, Wow! And because they go, wow, all of a sudden they begin to live, wow. Yeah. And when they live that out, that expression is made and people hear that and they're drawn to that. Because you know what? Our world today needs some wonder yeah. apart from the wonder that we're shown on the television screens and the movie theaters. There is wonder to be known. So these shepherds, oh man, what men they were in this moment. And we're going to learn more about them in a minute. But here I'm going to tell you something. They, they were men who experienced some great emotion on the night Christ was born. And they are able to see and to know and to firsthand take a look. And behold, behold, he who is born king of Israel. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Can you imagine Imagine for a moment if you had been them and you were able to walk into that manger and look down at that baby and look into that baby's eyes and all of a sudden I cannot imagine what the emotion would have been when you looked into his eyes and he's looking back up at you and you know him. He's the one. He's the one. We've all been waiting for. You know what? He's the one that's going to take away my sin. I love that. The shepherds encountered that emotion. Gentlemen, nothing you dismay for.
For Jesus Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. The shepherds at those tidings rejoiced much in their mind and left the flocks to feed storm and wind and went to Bethlehem Street way that blessed babe to find oh tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy oh tidings of comfort and joy oh, and went to Bethlehem they came to where this infant lay they found him in a manger where oxen feed on hay. His mother Mary kneeling unto the Lord did pray for tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh tidings of comfort. read again one portion Luke 2 10 through 14 and what I want to say here and I want you to understand is this the shepherd's understanding of truth the understanding of truth at Christmas and I mentioned to you all ago they received some new truth they received some new understanding the angel said to them do not be afraid I bring you good news of great joy which shall be for all the people for today in the city of David there has been born a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared a great multitude of heavenly angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Here's what I want to say. We want you to understand something here. The message the angels brought, he said, was good news. Okay, good news about the birth of of a savior the long awaited messiah is now been born and he is laying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying there in that sheep stall okay so in in for me in studying this um some years back i was studying in luke chapter four and i come across a term called the favorable year of the lord and I studied that and I communicated that with the church and we related that to something we'd never thought about and it's the year of Jubilee, okay? We understanding of that and there was a, a deep part of that. This last few weeks, 
uh, through some study, the Lord has led me to learn some things and to see some things about the manger, about where they were, uh, what was going on there, and how they happened to be in that place. And it brings out a bigger picture of something for me, okay? So in my study and in my reading and being back in the book of Micah in chapter 5 and knowing that Bethlehem is a place prophesied from where they're going to be, uh, I backed up and I was reading in chapter 4 of Micah. And I'm just going to flip back there and read you these terms and we're kind of going to go from there. Micah chapter 4 verse 8 verse 9. This whole section of prophecy is concerning the birth of a Messiah, which is to come. In chapter 5, it opens up and said it's going to be in Bethlehem, you know, to a little clan of Judah. But chapter 4, verse 8 says, As for you, tower of the flock, heel of the daughter of Zion, you to you it will come. Even the former dominion will come. The kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, why do you cry loudly? Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished? The agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth. Now, in that passage of Scripture, it talks about something called there. The tower of the flock. The tower of the flock was not something I have ever really thought about, a phrase I've not ever even comprehended, but I looked that up in the median uh, middle of my Bible, and there's a term there that's called migdal idar. Migdal idar. That is the Hebrew word migdal means tower, and idar means the flock. So what he's saying is, and here's what I've learned, it goes all the way back into the book of Genesis in chapter 35, when Rachel is pregnant with Benjamin, and they're moving, and, and uh, Israel, Jacob, has moved his family down to Bethlehem. When she got to Bethlehem, she gave birth to Benjamin, and she died. She died in childbirth. And he went, it says, a little ways, 20, so far, like 2,000 feet from that location, and he buried his wife there, okay? And you can see there's still markers to indicate where she's buried. And then it says Jacob went on another thousand feet and he pitched his tent there and he erected something that was called the Tower of the Flock. And here's what the Tower of the Flock was. It was a tower that was built and it looked out over three fields where the sheep would be grown. And he was very wealthy in sheep. And so they would grow sheep there. And in that tower you could be up over the edge where you could see all the fields completely and where all those sheep were, were, were being grown. As time went on and the worship of God grew in the time of David and on into the temple, at that spot, they raised sheep. Okay, they raised sheep at that tower and it had pens. It had like, it's, right now it's called a grotto, okay? And it's kind of like a semi-cave in the bottom down in there. There's several of them. And that's where they would raise the sheep that were going to Jerusalem to be sacrificed in the temple. So they wanted those sheep, when the shepherds out in the field, when their sheep were going to have ewes, they would bring them into there, under that tower, into those semi-cave places, and they would raise sheep. And get this, when the, they, they were trained by the rabbis, the shepherds are trained by the rabbis to raise perfect unblemished sheep, okay? So what they're going to do is when the sheep's born, they bring them in there and get this. They take the sheep when they're born and place them in there and they wrap them in swaddling clothes. They wrap the sheep. They wrap the sheep up because they didn't want any blemish on the sheep. They wanted to have the perfect sheep for the sacrifice. Now, I haven't even thought about this before, but when the sacrifice is going on in the temple in Jerusalem in the years to come, you know, the male sheep, they wanted perfect male sheep to go for the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. And each family was hoped to have one. So they literally had to raise thousands of sheep. So there's these specially trained shepherds who were out in the field growing these sheep all these years with the hope of bringing forth the perfect sheep, wrapping them up and carrying them to the tower of the flock. The Migdal Idar. So here's the deal. 
It is highly believed and between, I've read on this, honestly, extensively in the last two weeks, that it's highly believed that that is the spot where Jesus was born. That he was born in the sheep stall, right where they raised these sheep. And when the angel said to them, you'll have a sign, swaddling clothes. Because here's what's going to happen. The shepherds are going to get up. And if you know that, when he said, get up, let's go, said they get up in a hurry and they go. It's not like they're going to go look at each other and go, where are we headed? It's like, we are not where we're going. They're going where they wrap the sheep, where they wrap the baby lambs. We're going to there because we know where we're going. Because, and get this, I believe this. There was no room in that inn because Jesus was supposed to be born in that manger where they were going to wrap him in the swaddling clothes that the perfect lamb was to be born into. And when you know that and you begin to look at that in Scripture and you begin to try to process that and you try to try to understand that, all of a sudden the Christmas story went like, wow! I went, wow! And that makes me think of this. It's like, that's amazing to me because here's why we look at this story. Here's how we look at it. We go... Poor Mary and Joseph, they ride that donkey all the way down there. And when they get there, there's just nowhere for them to stay. You know why there's nowhere for them to stay? Because God had the place planned for them to stay. He never does anything haphazardly by circumstance. Everything that he does, he knows and he is bringing about to bring about his glory in this earth. Mary and Joseph had to walk that out. I have to walk mine out. You have to walk yours out. But what it is, is he is bringing about his plan and his purpose. And all of a sudden, man, I just like, this word's just been in my mind. Migdal Idar, the tower of the flock, the place where Jesus is born. People have battled over that little piece for 2,000 years now. The Muslims controlled it at one time. They tried to desecrate it. And in the 4th century... Constantine, who was head of the Roman government, took it and he became a Christian and he had a church built over it in 353 A.D. that's still standing. It is believed to be the oldest standing church and you know it now called the Church of the Nativity. And if you go to the Church of the Nativity and you go down into the bottom where those grottos are, where they raise those sheep, there's where it is highly believed that baby Jesus was wrapped and laid in a manger. That's a wow to me. I don't know. That's a wow to you. Because it, 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 takes, it takes the story bigger. It makes God, not that he's not great enough, but it makes me see him as greater. It makes him unfold to me in, in some way different when I look at that and see that and think about that. And for me, I just flipped this morning and, and, and I just, to a couple of things that come into my mind when I, when I tried to process through that again in Hebrews 1. Listen to this. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets and in portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, Jesus, the baby born in the manger, who grew up to be the Son of God who died on the cross, whom he resurrected from the dead. He is the radiance of his glory. He is the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And he has made, after he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's a wow. All of a sudden, Christmas just got greater because what they got in their moment, in their place of Christmas, is they got, get this, some new understanding. They got some new understanding of truth and then was able to experience that truth. And that's where they found the wonder. So as we look at that today for us, we think about this. Is there, there's a phrase in an obscure little book called Micah that we never read in Micah. I never read in Micah. And you go in there and all of a sudden you find this nugget of truth that tells us something that links all the way back into the Christmas story and about the birth of Christ. How awesome is that to think about? And then here's what we can know. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ suffered 
for you, leaving you as an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was there deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself. I love this. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross so that he might die to sin, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we are healed. For we were continually straying like sheep. But now we have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of our soul. Here's the thing. He is that lamb. That, and I want you to hear this. He don't just cover our sin. He takes it away. He takes it away. And we, we have a hard time fathoming that, getting into that. When they slaughtered lambs in the Old Testament, it was to cover a sin for a season. He came and took it away. He took all of it on himself. That's why he had to come to be born in that manger, to be born in that spot, to be wrapped in them in his clothes, because he was this, he is this, the perfect lamb of God. Amen. In Revelation, it says this, the lamb slain before the foundation of of the world. You. you know what that says? God had a plan. Before Adam ever sinned, God had a plan. Amen. Thank you. And it started in that manger. It started there. And when we can know that, when no shepherds knew that, they just went, wow, glory be to God. That is amazing. That is awesome to them. That is understanding that you and I need to know. Listen, this book has got in it what we think of as the secrets of God, the mind of God, the way of God revealed to us through his word so that we can understand, that we can know him, and we can know this. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus was born into the manger. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He is the perfect Lamb of God. And he says to all of this, come, come and know, come and see, come and taste of my goodness, come and to know Jesus, Jesus, the Messiah. Oh, Migdal Idar. Read it, study it, find out what God wants you to know about it. Because for me, it gave me a whole new level of wonder as I behold him, Jesus, Messiah, the Son of God. Okay. Mm.
Amen. The last thought of this is this. The shepherds, simply this, and the greatness of God. The shepherds and the greatness of God. They felt their emotion. Okay. And they processed through their emotion. Man, they got some awesome revelation. Okay. And then, just listen to the close of this. When they had seen this, verse 17, they made known the statement which had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. So you think about this in this place of the greatness of God. And we talked about that just a moment ago. When they got the revelation that they got in that moment, and they, they quickly looked at each other and said, we're going, we're going. They didn't have to decide, uh, we're going to vote. We're going to go or not go? We're going. They looked at each other and it said they, they began to move in out. They came in a hurry. They came to where Mary and Joseph was. And they were able to behold uh, baby Jesus. And then when they did that, they began to speak of the greatness of God. Now, I want to tell you something. Before they would have seen him in the manger, they would have spoke about the promise of a coming Messiah. See, they would have talked about that, and that would have meant something to them. The people in that day, man, they were, they were hungry to know of this Messiah that was going to come that had been promised to them. And in their mind, they thought he's going to come and he's going to deliver us from Rome. But no, he's going to deliver us from the power of evil. He's going to deliver us from the power of Satan. He's going to deliver us from the rulers of this world, and he's going to give us life. And we're going to know that. After they saw him, all of a sudden, they saw on that night, the king, the, the name above all names. They saw the one who's going to say, I'm the bread of life. They saw the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies and then turn around and say, do you believe that? They begin to see and understand and comprehend firsthand. All of a sudden in that moment, the greatness of God. Here's what I want to tell you. For Christmas this year, we should all pray. And we should ask God this question. God, help me see your greatness. Help me see your glory. Help my life be transformed by the glory and the greatness of who you are. Because when we are, then he becomes to be moved. And all of a sudden, we're not afraid to proclaim that name wherever we may be. Whatever we may be facing in the moment, we can look at it and we can understand that. I, I love that. Hebrews, I mean uh, Philippians 2, when it said even though he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness and being conformed into the likeness even unto death. And then he says this, every knee will bow. Every tongue, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. I believe this. Whether you do it now or you do it later, I believe there's going to be a time when we, some people come before God and they go, you are great. And he said, you should have said that a long time ago. You should have confessed my greatness when I led you to know that and to experience and to know my greatness. Here's what I want to tell you. These shepherds left this place changed because they began to see anew and different because of all that they had heard, all that they had seen, all that they had experienced of the greatness of God. Do you need to know that place? Do you need to know that place? Hey, here's what we're going to do. It is we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing Silent Night. Okay? And then we're going to sing with that, What a Wonderful Name. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name. And here's what he's going to say to us. Behold my greatness. You express to me who you know me to be. I want to reveal myself to you anew and afresh today. I want this Christmas to be a Christmas you would remember. Because all of a sudden whew, you knew. You knew the greatness of God. Father, we thank you. 
thank you that we can come into this place today and to worship you. God, in this moment, our mind focuses to that spot, to that place, to that little grotto in the side of that mountain, that little carved out place where the shepherds saw the lambs be born, where the shepherds that night was able to behold the Lamb of God that was born that night. So Lord, I pray right now for each of us as we sing and as we absorb this place of knowing that silent night. And then Lord, we turn and we look toward Calvary and we see God, the greatness of God revealed in a place like of suffering to bring about forgiveness of our sin. And we say in our heart, what a wonderful name. What a wonderful name. The name of Jesus. May we behold you this day. God, as we worship you in this place, this, this Christmas season, and we thank you. Lord, as we sing this, this can be as an invitation for anyone who maybe needs to come and to bow on this altar and, and just say to you, Lord, I, I don't know your greatness. I don't know your forgiveness. I do know this. I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I'm undone. And today I feel you calling me to know something different than I've never ever known before. Uh, you said there's a good news and I need some good news. I need to know about some good news of salvation, the good news of forgiveness, the good news of being a follower of, of hope and a promise. So Lord, you have your way in our heart and our life. And may we in this place worship you on this, we think of this holy night, this silent night. And Lord, then as we behold, what a wonderful name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. the rain.
the wonderful name of Jesus says, and let's just sing it out to him and worship him today. everyone would stand. <clears throat> Thank you for being at Solitude today. God bless you. Hope you have a great Christmas here. I hope you have some good, powerful emotion this Christmas. I hope you can understand a little bit of a greater revelation of God through Christmas. Seek that out. Know that. And may you just know this, the greatness of God.